Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, Randy Kay here. Welcome to the Heaven Series. I have an amazing guest today. His name is Santosh a chargey, and he goes by the name of Sandy as well. I may call him that, but his story is, is really amazing. He was raised in a Hindu family. In fact, his father was a, a high-ranking member of the, the priesthood, if you will, of uh, the Hindu religion, and then he experienced a, a rupture causing internal bleeding that the physicians could not stop, and then he was ushered before the gates of heaven. And then God relayed to him a number of messages for you. So, Santosh, it is great to have you with us today. Hello, everyone. My name is Santosh Acharji, but people call me Sandy Acharji. That's okay with me. I was born and raised in India in a Hindu family where my father and mother were very conservative Hindus. So all I knew was Hinduism from my childhood until when I, I'm now in the US, Cleveland, Ohio. And one night I had a severe chest pain and that actually took me to the ICU of the hospital where everyone thought I was having a heart attack Ended out, ended out not to be a heart attack, but some gallstones ruptured. And when they ruptured, they attacked the nearby organ called pancreas. And they went from one end to the other end. As a result, my pancreas was bleeding. And to make the long story short, my doctor said, there's nothing they can do for me. There's no such medication or procedure for me. To be saved. All mm -hmm. he said, all he said to me, you can pray and hope and hope that your heart rate will come down, that they can do something. So that's how everything started. And that in the hospital, things started to get complicated farther and farther until one day I collapsed. I had a code blue in that hospital. And I died from in that hospital, mm -hmm. physically died. And I was gone for three days and three nights. And then in the meantime, I had no recollection of what happened to me, but I still remember every second of what happened outside this world. Because all along, I thought that once I die, that's it. Your life is finished. But then when I died, I realized my life did not finish. There is another life after that. And that's what I want to share with you. Now, Santosh, at the time this happened, you were not a, be a believer in Jesus as your Lord. You, in fact, came from a Hindu family, and not just a Hindu family, but one that was very, um, very high ranking within the Hindu uh, religion. So tell us about your father actually was raised you as a Hindu, and that's, that's the state in which you entered into this experience. So tell us a little bit about that background, if you will. Well, my father was a very well-renowned and well-respected you know, Sanskrit scholar, Sanskrit is the, is the original language where all the Indian languages come from, most of them. So he was a scholar in that. And not only that, he was very respected, well respected for the, for the, for the priestly activities that he used to do. He was a very honored person. So that's the background that I have. And my mother was a very strong, conservative Hindu as well. But I took a different route. I 
went into the into the engineering field, technical field, and that you know took me from India to Germany for further training. And from Germany, then I immigrated to Canada, where I lived for many years. And from Canada, I was transferred to Brazil. And from Brazil, I went back to Canada. And then from Canada to US, where I got transferred. So I ended up here. But during my you know, working life, I traveled almost all over the world. It was a very responsible job. And God took care of me, and I got I got several promotions, you know, during that time. And every time there was a promotion, there was more responsibilities. Mm. So God took care of me. I had everything in my life that I was looking for, everything I got. But then, when I was in the hospital, when the doctor said they can do nothing, and I kept first time I was thinking, what good is it? What good is it? All the, you know, the money and everything I'm getting, what good is it? Now, I'm in a hospital. The doctor said they cannot do anything. So all he can do, all I can do is pray and hope. So what good is all these things? That's mm. what I was thinking at the, at, the, at the hospital bed. Yeah, sometimes, uh, Santosh, we lose sight of the fact that all of those guests that we have have gone th through a crisis moment before entering into their heaven encounter, in some cases, a hell encounter. And I believe you have something to share with us about that as well. Um, and so you have a special message for us in terms of heaven. So uh, just to recount your story now, so you're in the hospital and you're bleeding internally. The doctors initially didn't know what they what was going on. They thought maybe you had a heart attack your heart was racing at over 200 beats per minute. Uh, and you were at this crisis point and you had died. And then uh, what happened when, when, that, when life uh, ceased for you and you went into this other realm? Well, I was at the time, I was at the ICU of this hospital. And at the moment, my wife was with me. My son came to visit with me. My daughter-in-law was there. They used to live in north of Detroit at the time. And my granddaughter was there. So I gave my final blessings to them. And then I collapsed on that bed. Mm. So when I collapsed in the bed, all my senses were gone immediately. I could not see my, my wife and my family. I could not speak to them, they all disappeared. And then, but the only thing was there, still there, was my hearing. I could still hear for several minutes what's going on in this room. So that tells me the hearing would be the last thing that we lose when you die in this, in this world. That's what I think. And then through the hearing, I could see a lot of footsteps in the room before that, I could hear one of the you know, registered nurses calling on the intercom, code blue, code blue, code blue, room number such and such. I did not know what the code blue meant at the time. Then I could hear a lot of footsteps in the room and they actually drove everybody out, including my family, and they took over and by Hearing what they're saying, I think they were trying to revive me, but they could not. Because the last thing, very last thing that I remember is one doctor telling the other doctor, we are rapidly losing him. He is not responding at all. And the other doctor said, we just lost him. And that's the final thing I remember from this world until I came back. Mm. I came back after three days and three nights. And what they did to me, I did not know. I only heard from my doctors later on what happened. Mm. So mm. What, they, what they did to me is they could not revive me. So they said they 
induced coma in me. I don't know what that meant. And they took me to the to the surgery room. Oh, they put me on the ventilator first. They took me to the surgery room because one of the reasons I had code blue, my lungs got filled up with blood. There was this little malfunction of no, not intentionally, but the medical people did something wrong, I think. As a result, my lungs got filled up with blood. When it fully, you know, immersed with blood, I could not take any more breath. And that's how I died. In that you were you were literally um, you know, suffocating to death at that point, but you were at an induced coma. Uh, yeah, and and during that during that period of time, now is am I correct in understanding that after you had a release, did you did you well? Let me ask this question: Did you um, did you see yourself? Were you pulled by something? Uh, were you in a place? What what was the the place you found yourself immediately after you were released from your body? Okay. At that moment, I felt that everything is dead, dark. I couldn't see anything for it. I don't know how long it was. Everything, but then I all of a sudden I realized my physical death did not finish me. I'm still alive. Only thing my body is not there, but everything my body could do, I could still do. I could still think, I could still analyze. I could, I could do everything my body did, but my, my physical body was not there. So that really brought this question that my life was not over with my physical death. There's another life after that. At that moment, when I was thinking, I saw a bright light appeared before me. And that light was so bright. And when it was coming near me, I knew that light has superior authority. I have to obey that light. Nobody had to tell me. And then when the light came near me, I could see my dead body on the hospital bed. That I just came out. The light took over me. It's like more or less like engulfed me with its radiance. And the light was so bright, I could not see anything, everything else disappeared except the light that was in front of me. The light took me, I call this light a divine light because it was taking me someplace, but wherever it's taking me, I knew it meant good for me. So during the transition, I fell in love with the divine light because his, its purpose was to protect me from any harm or any wrongdoing. Together we traveled for quite some time. And during this transition, all I could feel once in a while that we're going through some dark tunnels. And then at the end of the journey, the light stopped. When the light stopped, I had to stop. Then when I look in front of me, I saw the light was actually shining on top of a huge compound. That compound was so beautiful, marvelous. And I could see everything even better than what I can see normally in this, in this world. Because once we are out there, our vision is unlimited. What I mean by that, I could see from one end to the other end without any obstruction in between. I could see everything what's going on on the other side. And I could also zoom in like a powerful camera can do. But in this life, we cannot do that. Okay? And then once the light stopped on that beautiful compound, and as soon as I saw that compound, I see there's many, many mansions in this beautiful. It's all surrounded by 
high walls. Okay. And then I counted there were 12 gates all around and that none of the gates were open, were open for me. I desperately wanted to go inside, but I could not go inside. I was just outside of the outside of the gate. And then I also saw many, many angels there, many. And those angels, they were actually, their mission is to protect the territory of this beautiful compound. And when I saw the angels, then I realized I'm looking at the kingdom of heaven. And I desperately wanted to get inside. But I could not get inside because none of the gates were open for me. And I was very sad. And I was standing on a huge platform. That platform would be about a thousand feet long, it would be about 250 feet wide. And I was on the extreme left end of this platform. My immediate think, immediate reaction was, it seems like on a very high ground, how come this platform doesn't have any railing? What if, if I fall down, where am I going to fall? So I looked on my left and I looked down below where I would fall would be enormous depth. And that was deep dungeon, dark world. There was no light there. And the place that I would fall was a burning lake of fire. That's where I was going to fall from that platform. And that made me very sad because I desperately wanted to go in front into that compound, but I can't because all gates are closed. Only option I have is to, is to dive down on my left into the deep dungeon dark world. And that's, those, that wall down there is all abyss. You know what I mean by abyss? Once I fall down, I cannot climb up. That will be the end of it. And I was there. I want to go forward, but I can't. I cannot go back where I came from because I said, no, no. Once we leave this world, we got a one-way ticket with no return. Only option I have is to fall on my left. At that moment, I was very sad and I sincerely wished I had an alternative. At that moment, I was looking on that platform I looked towards the center of the platform, like I mentioned, 2,000 feet long, 200, right around the center of it. I see there is a three steps, like, a, like an altar. And on the third step, I saw there is a huge throne. And that on that throne, it looks like somebody was sitting there. So when I looked up, Lo and behold, that's where I saw the Lord Almighty, Lord Jesus Christ. At the time, I did not know that he was Lord Jesus Christ, but I knew he was the Almighty. Nobody needed to introduce him to me because I knew. I knew he was the Lord of everything. He was Lord of all. And then... When I, I looked at his face only once, but I could not look at him second time because shame and guilt took over me because up until then I committed so many sins and every sin that I committed was flushed before my eyes and I was looking down below. I could not look at his face face, I was looking at his feet and I kept repeating the same thing over and over. Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I committed so many wrongdoings in my life. Please forgive me. 
I was begging for his mercy. I was looking at his feet and I was shaking because I knew that would be the last day of my life. I had no other choice but to dive into that lake of fire. I kept repeating the same thing, Lord, please forgive me. I knew that at any moment I was going to dive. Then the Lord spoke to me. When he spoke to me, he had a deep authoritative, authoritative voice. But when he spoke to me, he spoke with so love and compassion. I was thinking of the worst, but when he spoke to me, I could understand through any of the languages that I know. And when I spoke back, he even understood even before I said anything. When the Lord spoke to me first, he said, what are you doing here? I shrugged my shoulder, meaning I don't know. He said, I'm sending you back to the earth. But when you are back, I want you to love your family and love your children. When the Lord spoke to me, I had little courage because I was afraid. I was thinking of the worst, but when he spoke to me, I could hear the tenderness and the compassion and the mercy in his voice. And then when I was looking at him, at his feet, right around on his left side, I saw there was a very narrow door, like a narrow gate. And that was the only gate that was open. All the gates are closed. So that's the only gate that we can go through is that narrow gate. And I through that narrow gate, I could see the entire kingdom of heaven through. But I could not dare because the Lord was a giant. When he appeared to me, he was a giant. And I am this world, I'm only five feet, six inches tall. And the giant is in front of me. How can I go through the door? I, I felt like running through the door, but I could not dare. I can only go through the door only if he lets me in, otherwise it's, it's, it's impossible. So when the Lord spoke to me, sending me back to the earth, I was, thought that was gonna happen any moment. So I got some courage. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, please tell me when I go back, please tell me which church I need to join, which temple, which mosque, which synagogue, or any other place, because that's all I knew, okay? Which, where do you want me to go? The Lord did not respond. And then I kept pleading. I said, Lord, please tell me where I should join, because when I go back, I'm gonna be committing the same things over and over. But next time, when you see me, I want to go through this narrow door here. Finally, after repeated pleadings, he responded, said, I was asking for church and temple and mosque and synagogue or any other religious places. He said to me, those things are not important to me. I was shocked was all along. I thought you have to be you know, a religious person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he said, no, I want to see, I want an honest relationship. I want to see how true, how sincere, how honest you were with me, not just once a week, every day. 365 days a year, how honest are you? That's the relationship I'm looking 
I seriously did not understand what it meant to me. And then I said, Lord, I'm a simple human being. Please tell me what I need to do so when you see me next time, I can walk through this door. And then he gave me some instructions. Please give me some instruction. He gave me, he gave me one directive, like one directive and five instructions. First directive was love your family and love your children. That's mandatory. You must love your family and love your children. And the first instruction is always tell the truth. Now, always tell the truth has two meanings for me. First is don't lie. Secondly, is tell the truth like what's happening here, like what you are witnessing in front, what you're witnessing on your left. Share the truth. Share the truth with anyone. Okay. So I got the first instruction. And the second instruction was the wages of sin is death. From this day on forward, commit no more sins. I got that. Third instruction is said. Surrender yourself completely. I should underline the complete unto me in your daily life. Let me be the driver in your life. And then fourth instruction was walk with me. I did not understand what that meant because I came from a different background. Walk with me. The way I understand is walk in the same direction where the Lord wants to go. If it's going forward and I'm going backward or sideways, then we are not walking together. And the following instruction he gave me is always be kind to the poor. Be generous to the poor. They need your help. Now, when you think of the always be kind to the poor, most often we think they need financial help only. No, not necessarily. People can be poor in many ways. They could be physically poor, mentally poor, educationally poor. And these days when I look at it, you see, most people, even people that go in the church all the time, they're spiritually poor. They don't have the relationship that the Lord is looking for. So that's the message that he gave me. He also asked me later on, we talked for several, I don't know how long it is because the time, I don't know the time, how, how long it spoke to me. It seems to me like we, we talked for each other for, for a long period of time. And he also asked me to write two books. I said, Lord, I've never written a book in my life. He said, don't worry. You will write two books. So through his help, I wrote the books that he and then later on, with the help of this, my friend here and this church here, they helped me to put the two books together. Okay? So people don't have to buy the two books. And that book is now available in the market is My Encounter with Jesus at Heaven's Gate. And that's, that's the new name of the book. So that's basically what happened. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them.
Well, we will have your book listed in the body of this uh, YouTube as well. So you can click on it I, um, and, and you can read Santosh's uh, story. Got to focus, uh, Santosh. I'm just mesmerized by your story. Just, uh, just absolutely um, uplifting because God had told you, was it four, four things? I was counting them. Four things, I believe. Five that, things. Five things, sorry, that he was telling you that you needed to do. But I can't get beyond the fact that you are standing before him and Jesus Christ was not a part of any of your pre-beliefs. That is what you never thought of. So how did, how did he reveal himself as the Lord Jesus, the, the son of God? How did, how did you know that this was Jesus? I did not know. Even from the beginning, I did not know that I knew it was God. God himself, but I did not know that I met Jesus because it was bothering me, even though when I went back to work, I got additional responsibilities. They sent me from, my first assignment was in China where I had to go very frequently. And once the China project was finished, then my next project was in India. So I was busy with the work for a while, but it was really bothering me what actually I witnessed because all the things that I witnessed there is no such thing in our Hindu scriptures. I was familiar with some of the Hindu scriptures, but I did not know. I was wondering why I did not encounter the Hindu gods and the goddesses and all these things that we know, but who? I witnessed who I encountered is not like them. Okay. And then finally, after my projects got finished and the two assignments that he gave me is to write two books when they're completed. And when I was writing them, I was writing on the computer and as if somebody was writing through me because I had no clue what I was writing. <laughs> I was not a writer and then I was too bothering me. What did I witness? And then my daughter, she was invited to come to the church. This is a great church in Middleburg Heights, Ohio. I drove by the church many times, but I, ne I never went inside. My daughter was invited here to join a choir group because she, she came from the Cleveland State University in the choir group. So she, she joined and she invited, you know, my wife and me to attend it. And I think that was a Easter service, most likely. Most likely Easter service in 2010 or 11. That's the first time I came to this church. And that day, the senior pastor here, Jonathan Schaefer, and the, very, the, the sermon that he preached that day as if he was talking to me, he's talking about the narrow door. I had no clue what the narrow door was. So he explained what the narrow door was in that meeting. And then I went back and started reading those, those verses in the Bible. And then started to, you know, make make sense what I witnessed, and then I started to come here every week, and every week I took notes and I started to get into the Bible more and more. Then I knew what I was looking at. That was none other than Jesus Christ. Oh Jesus, Jesus Christ is the one that we can meet in the human form of God. The real God, you probably won't meet him until we go inside the heaven. But that's, we cannot see with our human body because we do not have pure hearts. If we have pure hearts, then only we can see the real God. Otherwise, we can't. Mm. So, so that, that, Such an important point. Um, I mean, I'm just 
just incredibly amazed at how how God took you on this journey after revealing himself to you and saving you from the lake of fire, uh, Santosh. And then you were invited uh, to this church and you saw the, the God that you had witnessed uh, that was not um, the Hindu gods with all of these. And we've seen pictures of them with multiple arms and kind of, um, you know, these faces that are very unlike uh, the human form. And you saw then finally, and you saw the narrow gate. And of course, that's within the Bible. Um, that those are entering into heaven, enter through the narrow gate. So you were correlating, that is, you were taking all of these things that you were learning in the Bible, and you were ascribing those, that is, you were associating those with the God of Jesus Christ. That, that's incredible. That's incredible. What? We did, sorry. Please. No, please, go ahead. All I can say God is so merciful, so gracious, and he desperately wants anyone from any religion, any culture to come to him and ask him to forgive him or her. Mm. And he's waiting for us. Yes. Without, without his mercy, without his blessings, we can do nothing. We can have nothing. Nothing I know because everything I had, none of thing, none of those things went with me. Nothing. When I left this world, nothing went with me. Not my family, not my money, anything, not my job, nothing. Mm. And that's going to happen to each and every one of us. So we still have time still have time that we can come to the Lord, ask for his forgiveness, ask for his mercy. Yes. And everyone will get it. Everyone. Absolutely. Santosh, I've got to ask you a question. Going back to your experience where you are on this platform and you, you told us the exact dimensions of the platform, which is in and of itself amazing. But you are seeing below the lake of fire and you're seeing, you're seeing in, in the distance this huge figure, you need to be uh, God, this authoritative figure. And you were seeing these gates, one of which entered into the space in which God resided. Um, why do you think now that God saved you from that destiny that might have been awaited had you not followed the truth, which God had told you to do. Why do you think God had um, preserved your life? You could have very easily have, have died and, and not returned. Uh, why do you think you were saved? Well, two things. First thing, his very first commandment to me is love your family and love your children. So love in my interpretation is the name of God. He is love. So if we can not love my family and my, love my children, I cannot love God. Mm. And the second thing is love your neighbor who is next to you. The neighbor doesn't mean the next door neighbor, it could be who is around you, okay? Where God placed me with my, my wife, my children, whoever, you know, my, wherever I come to church, whoever is next to me, love them as they are. Okay? Mm. I'm not here to change other people. I'm here to change myself. Mm. That's... Yes. It's, it's a profound message, Santosh. And I, I think in particular, you know, God knowing all things knew that you would bring that message home. He knew your heart as well. He knew where your heart was to seek after that, that truth. But love is something as you're, you're right, uh, that, that is God is defined in the Bible. And John is uh, 
Book of John that um, that he is described as as love, consummate love. Uh, and so when you bring that message, which is simple in itself, however, not easily attained. Um, he also one of the, the one of the five directions he gave to you was in seeking the truth, which you did, and the truth. And that's another scripture. And you shall seek the truth and the tr truth shall set you free. John 8, 32, I believe. Um, that truth set you free to know who he was. So when you realized, when you became a believer in, in Jesus, in that experience where you met Jesus, the God of Jesus Christ, um, Associate that moment where you became a believer to what you saw in heaven. How did that, how is that the same or how is that different? I have, I can describe that as an internal peace. We can have money and all kinds of other things. They are not going to give us internal peace. Internal peace and happiness and joy will only come by surrendering to the Lord and knowing him one-on-one, -on -one, surrendering to his mercy, to his grace, to his direction, to his guidance. But in this world, we like to do everything on our own, and that's where you get in trouble. Mm. So you don't ask for his guidance, his direction, which direction I should go, what I should do. If we want to do that, he is there to help us all the time. Because I am spending not a lot, but considerable amount of time one on one with him. And over the years, I see how real he is. He has responded to all my prayers up until now. And that's what I'd like to share with, with you is some people think I can, I, I committed sins, he forgave me, but I can commit again and he'll forgive me. I don't take it that way. I take it this way that love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. Now, if you love God, will you commit a sin? Mm. You're not going to commit a sin if you love him. And that's the purpose of us for coming to a church is to love him. So if you really love him, you're not going to commit a sin. So question of sin doesn't arise if you really love him. If we don't love him, yes, the sin comes in nature. So true, Santosh. And I have a question regarding your family. And you mentioned your, your daughter inviting you to church. Um, were, were your family members at this time, did they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Were there still some um, who were believing in the in the Hindu uh, religion? All, all my family members are still Hindus in their heart because they don't know the Lord because they didn't experience what I experienced. And this is something that I cannot really force upon somebody else. It had, they have to do on their own. So I can only guide them if they want to hear but yes, some of my family members probably don't want to hear. If they don't want to hear, whatever I say is going to go through one year and will come out the other year. Mm. So I left everything up to my Lord. Yeah. I know when the Lord said, love your family and love your children. So if I love my family, love my children, and I surrender everything to my Lord, then everything is up to him. He yes. He will take care of it. 
So true. You know, um, Santosh, we had interviewed uh, a person who recently, who had been raised in the Buddhist religion and went to the Buddhist temple as a child and they actually shared Buddhism uh, with his friends. And he came to know Jesus uh, when he really didn't know much about Jesus at all uh, outside of maybe he had heard the name uh, and came to know Jesus. And that's one thing that um, as people have shared with us, like yourself, who have come from different religions, not grown in the Christian faith, uh, that have realized this God of love, uh, the one who had Jesus, that is, uh, hang him that would hang from the cross for those who who actually despised him at the time, many of whom despised him, and he said, "Forgive them, to uh, the Father, uh, for they know not what they do." And you know, we can't help but but think that um, no other God would do that. No other God would sacrifice himself for those who despised him. If only they would surrender to uh, the Lord Jesus. And, you know, those who, who say that, um, you know, all, all uh, beliefs, all, all roads lead to, uh, to heaven, you know, I think have to come to terms with Jesus, what he said himself, and that is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It wasn't that he was, you talked about the narrow gate, the narrow path, into heaven. It wasn't that he did not want to save. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that God desires that all would be saved. It was that there's just one way to get there. There's one way. Heaven is, heaven is a pure. Heaven is God's domain. There's nothing in heaven that is corrupted. There's nothing that is sinful, nothing that is evil. And for those of us who know Jesus as our Lord, who have been sanctified, that's a fancy religious term for that we have been purified, if you will, by the spirit, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, such that when we enter, our spirit is released into heaven, that we are made pure through Christ. And, and that's hard to understand or comprehend, uh, but, but you understand for those who have been either at the gate or passed through the gate, that you cannot bring impurity into heaven or else all of heaven would be made impure. And that's just a fact. That's just the way it is. And that makes common sense, I think. But in your case, and Santosh, I can see why he returns you because you have a profound message. And I encourage everyone who has somebody, whether they have come from a different religion or they have a different faith or perhaps they believe in kind of a potpourri of, of religions. You know, I'll just pick and choose which one I want that you bring them to this uh, interview and, and allow them to watch this and bring them to uh, Steve Fang's interview and allow them to watch that and see that, that it wasn't that God wanted to send either you, Santosh, or anyone else to that lake of fire. He wanted to, wanted to save you from that. And he gave you a second chance. So he sure did. If he didn't save me, I won't be here. <laughs> I, was gone, I was gone in 2006, uh, October 20, 21st. Mm. I was gone. Wow. Well, I, you know, I can say I don't, um, you now you're in the um, uh, Cleveland area and, and I've been to, and worked actually at the Cleveland Clinic um, in our cardiovascular uh, space for the minimally invasive surgery. And um, I, um, I'm thinking, I don't know your clinical report, your uh, report while you were in the hospital, but internal bleeding, everything I've learned from you Internal bleeding, pan uh, pancreas is bleeding, uh, heart rate accelerated. Um, there's no way uh, to intervene at this point. Certainly, um, pharmaceutically, 
and surgically perhaps, but then there would be further bleeding and, and then, you know, that, so there's no, no medical intervention outside of God's intervention, really, that I can think of, at least from knowing what I know that would have saved you. You had a miracle, didn't you? Yes, yes. So there's no doubt about that, no doubt. Yes. Mm. And you are a walking miracle today. And I don't know how much longer I'll be here, but it's whenever he take, calls me home, um, I'll be happy. I'll be happy to see him again. And hopefully that he'll let me go through that narrow door this time. Yes. Oh, well, <laughs> I think you can be assured of that. You're, you're headed uh, through those those gates of the narrow road to meet uh, your loving God. Um, Santosh, I've got to ask you because uh, each of our guests was returned, I believe, for a specific reason. Now you've articulated, you've uh, expressed that is the five things that God told you to take back for each of us, not just for yourself. But um, oftentimes there's a message that God has for those of us who have been returned. And so I'm gonna ask you this question, Santosh. What is that, if you were to single out one message that God sent you back to convey to those who are watching or listening to that, this, what would that be? Love one another. Hmm. Love one another. I know we have a lot of differences, differences in religions, cultures, skin colors or whatever love one another love is the only thing that can save us nobody mm. else can yes i didn't want to interrupt you there was there anything else santosh well yes um everything i like to appeal to anyone from any religion any culture Come to the real God, that is Jesus. Nobody else is out there. Where else can you find a God who come down and give his life for us so that we can be free and we can be saved? Mm. Nobody else has. Only God can. Nobody else. Yes. Yes. Absolutely true, you know, and I don't think any one of us should feel that we're being exclusive, although certainly it is exclusive because in, you have to know Jesus to enter through that narrow gate. Um, however, the exclusive, ex exclusivity is not by virtue of God not wanting no, he, he to go through that gate. He, want, he wants all of us to be there, every one of us. Yes. Absolutely, but there's only choice, one way. Choice is up to us. Yes. Choice. Just um, um, maybe one or two more questions and then we'll pray because I know there's some here. And again, I'm encouraging you please to bring um, your friends, family members who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior because we're going to be giving them an opportunity. And if you're watching this now and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're going to uh, pray with you so that you can be assured that you will enter through that narrow gate and that you will not enter into uh, the lake of fire. But um, uh, a final question or two, uh, Santosh, when you looked at this God and, and you had been introduced in the Hindu religion, gods, plural, who were of a strange nature. I mean, I've looked at, you know, the drawings and the statues and what have you and it kind of gives me the eebie-jeebies so when you when you look at at this at this god when you looked at this god in heaven how did he appear he appeared to me as a giant he was sitting on his in the judgment throne where i was on that platform on the sitting position from where i was i was about from my, where I was standing to where he was, would be approximately 600 feet. 
distance. So at that distance, when he was sitting, he was appearing to me like about 35 to 40 feet in his sitting position. Okay. So when he would stand up, like normally when he sit, it'd be probably about two and a half, three feet from the floor, three feet. So when you stand up, probably five and a half, six feet tall. So when he was sitting down, he was 35, 30, 35 feet. So when you stand up, it'd be at least 70 feet tall. So he's giant and I'm five foot, six inches. I have nothing. You know? So how can I fight a giant? You cannot, you mm. cannot fight a giant. I was, I felt like running and going to that, open narrow door it's it just doesn't happen we can only go to the narrow door only if he lets us otherwise he cannot so yeah these are the um that oftentimes people try to uh define uh the you know appearance and dimensions of god and what have you and you know, we know about the Trinity, God, the Father, the Son, and, and the Holy Spirit. We know about that dynamic where they are one. They are referenced as we in the Bible and Genesis, the book of Genesis. Um, and uh, we know about that. We don't fully understand that dynamic because it's exclusive to God. Um, but when we, when we have descriptions of God, when we have descriptions of Jesus as being familiar and yet mighty, um, there is a revelation that God has, I've noticed, to those who have had uh, experiences in the afterlife uh, that, is that is appointed for them only. That is how God reveals himself to them, is specific for how he wants to reveal himself to the person. So um, there should be no confusion as to, you know, some people say, well, his eyes were brown and blue and all of that stuff. I think we need to get away from that and really focus on the, the majesty, the almightiness and also how we of God and also how he reveals himself as he needs to reveal himself for, for uh, each person who is uh, presented to him. The same God, same God but um, he is revealed uh, in, in the three persons, but he's revealed that's, in a play, way that uh, we can, we need to be, need to see him. That's true, but at the end, I like to you know, suggest that everyone takes my Lord as gracious, graceful, merciful, and willing to help, very kind, generous, loving God. You know, my God is not, that's out there to take control of you. He wants us to be humble, like an obedient son, obedience. He wants, basically he wants us to be like, like his son, Jesus. He wants us to be, to be like him. So. I'm glad can, you said that, yes. If we can imitate the life of Jesus in me, we're doing, we're going in the right way. Well, you're a very humble man, Santosh, and you exude those characteristics uh, of our Lord. And I'm glad you said that because I don't think there's any other expression of God in any of the other religions uh, that can express that consummate, that total love as, uh, as in Jesus. Um, the, th the second question I had for you, Santosh, and then we'll uh, get to a very important part of this uh, final closure of this interview. And that is, you were on the platform, you saw God in the narrow road, the gate, there were a number of gates, but only one led to, uh, to heaven with, with God. Down below, you were seeing what you call the lake of fire, which we would ascribe to, to hell. Um, we don't want to stay there. We're going to have a we're, we're going to get away from that part of it. But when you saw that, can you tell us what that was like and how you felt when you looked at it at the time? You mean looked at down below? Mm -hmm. Yes. I was so afraid, so scared that where I stood right at the edge of the platform, I immediately 
went two steps on my right, so I don't fall down. It was so scary. And we need to stay away from that place because that means our permanent death. I knew if I dived in there, it would be my permanent death. Mm. There would be no, no temporary death. So, and I would again make an appeal to anyone from any culture, please, please come to know Jesus. Please surrender yourself. He is unlike any other God that we know. He is here to help us. Please come to him and ask for his forgiveness. There's not a single person in this world that has not committed any sins. And that includes me. And the very first thing we learn is how to tell lies. Why do I need to tell lies? I don't need to. Be, be sincere, be true, be honest. You don't need to tell lies. So there's not a single person who is who is not guilty of committing any sins. And with even one wrongdoing, will this allow us to enter into the heaven? Because like you said, the heaven is a pure, pure place. There's no room for any impurity there, no room. Mm. So even if he committed one sin by telling lies, how are you going to get rid of that? You can't get rid of it. Yes. Only way you can get rid of it by nailing it on the cross. Where Jesus took that sin away from you. Yeah, there's no way of self purification or no, of, uh, no number of lives that can get us to a point of perfection. <laughs> only one person can can do that, and it's only through. So the religion, uh, Jesus righteousness. I'm not against the religions. Religions are trying to, to make us perfect, but that's not good. Yeah, and that's, that's not good. Yeah, and I was an agnostic. You know, I was, uh, you know, the people that know my story. I actually tried to disprove all religions um, at Northwestern University, and uh, to try to find fault with them. And that was the one that really got me as an agnostic. One of the Kind of the knockout factors, if you will, Santosh, and that is, I thought, you know, I can't possibly uh, undo my way of thinking <laughs> entirely. You know, that's uh, if I see something or think a passive thought, somebody cuts me off in traffic, whatever happens, you know, I'm going to have an impure thought, and I cannot get to the point of of uh, self righteousness. I just can't. It's not, and not, and and that's that's the the wonder and the wonderful part of uh, what Jesus offered was a way not by virtue of of our doing but by virtue of our surrender to to be able to do that and so we have had people that have that have spoken about on this show spoken about hell uh, we've had Brian Melvin we've had Ivan Tuttle uh, we had um, uh, Steve uh, Fang who uh, mentioned who came from a Buddhist background. The others, one was an atheist. Uh, the other was an, an agnostic or atheist. So anyway, um, God does not want you to go there. He wants to go through that narrow gate. So now, Santosh, we're going to have an invitation prayer for those who want to know, be assured that they're going to go through that narrow gate on the day that your heart stops you will leave this earth you will leave this earth whether it's um, in in a few minutes or whether it's in a few or many years eventually you and i and santosh and all of us will leave this world and we will be ushered before uh, what is commonly called the afterlife so i'm going to ask you santosh to lead our audience 
into, and especially for those who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, into a prayer so that they can be assured that they will have Jesus in them and they will become, as uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, that he will uh, birth a new life in them. So uh, will you lead us in prayer, Santosh? Sure, sure, I'll try. I'm making this appeal to all my brothers and sisters, regardless of what religion, what culture, what society we belong to. This is a fact for everyone. If you are born into this world, you have to depart this world. There's no other exception. You can be the richest man in the world or the poorest person in the world. You have to live. Now, when we live, for myself, I only had two choices. I could either enter into the kingdom of heaven or I could dive down into the lake of fire. And I deserve to be in the lake of fire because I committed many sins in this life. And I'm so sorry for that. And that's what we need. So if you listen to my testimony, I am requesting you that please realize that you have committed some sins in your life as well. I'm not the only one. Everyone has committed sins. So if you have committed even one sin, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to go dive into the into the lake of fire. So please, please do not do that because once you go to the permanent death, that will be it. Please make it a point that you realize that you need help and that help is there. And that help is only available through the Lord Jesus Christ, nobody else. Nobody else can save us, only by surrendering to him. Please come to him, repent for your sins and give your heart to him and ask for his forgiveness, ask for his rescue. It's as simple as that. You don't have to be a religious person. You don't have to go into self-cleaning or self-improvement or anything. It's very simple. God made it so simple for us. Please take this. And I'm sure that my Lord will help you if you decide to do that. Just like he did to me. He will love you. He will save you. Thank you. Thank you. If you did pray with Santosh for the first time to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please contact us at randyk.org on the contact page. Let us know that you uh, prayed to receive Jesus and you want, uh, we'll send you more information. Uh, we have a prayer team. We have, we want to get in touch with you. We want to include you in our big family that uh, of uh, the body of Christ. Uh, and uh, please let us know at randyk.org. Um, and Santosh, I just thank you so much for your just absolutely wonderful, insightful, and inspiring message that you shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. God bless. And God bless you. And, and if you Know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Until next time, God bless. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.